God's blessings to you this 13th Sunday after Pentecost. The Old Testament lesson for today from the book of Isaiah, chapter 29, verses 11 to 19. The epistle from St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 5, verses 22 to 33. And the Holy Gospel from Mark, chapter 7, reading verses 1 to 13. Our sermon this Sunday is based on the appointed gospel lesson, excuse me, the appointed Old Testament lesson from Isaiah chapter 29. We're going to focus on verses 15 to 17, and I will read those at this time in Jesus' name. Ah, you who hide deep from the Lord your counsel, whose deeds are in the dark, and who say, who sees us, who knows us? You turn things upside down. Shall the potter be regarded as the clay, that the thing made should say of its maker, he did not make me? Or the thing formed say of him who formed it, he has no understanding? Is it not yet a very little while, until Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field, and the fruitful field shall be regarded as a forest? Heavenly Father, these are your words, and therefore they are the truth. We ask you to sanctify us by this truth. Amen. To arrest the Son of God, to convict him of crimes he didn't commit, to sentence him to a death he didn't deserve, such deeds required the cover of darkness, and the members of the council knew it. Crowds were following Jesus during the day, but they had to go to bed sometime. Who will see us, they asked. Who will stop us? On Thursday night, Jesus was betrayed into their hands. They made their dark decisions, and all their dark deeds were carried out. By sundown the next day, God's Son was dead. Who saw us? they asked. Who stopped us? There was a man named Joseph from the town of Arimathea. He was rich and respected. He was a member of that same council. The Bible even singles him out as a prominent member of the council. He was also a good and just man who had not consented to their decision and deed. He had been numbered among the Lord's disciples, but he had kept that a secret until that Friday afternoon when he took courage and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down and wrapped it in a linen shroud and laid him in a tomb cut in stone where no one had ever yet been laid because it was his own tomb. And it was Joseph himself who rolled the large stone in front of it. Did anyone else from the council see what Joseph had done? Would they have cared if they did? Joseph was just one vote. He had not had the power to stop them while Jesus was alive. Let him take courage now that Jesus is dead. It's too late. We won, and nothing's going to change that. On the third day, from the darkness of Joseph's tomb came the good news. The stone was rolled away for all to see and know that Jesus had risen just as he said. A great reversal had taken place, a reversal which gives us confidence in this life and hope in the life to come. God's gifts overturn dark decisions. And today we're going to look at two of those gifts. First, new understanding of his eternal truth, and second, new life as he sees fit. God's people may gather to worship at the right place and the right time, but that doesn't mean they are immune from life's calamities. As Isaiah chapter 29 begins, God warns that times of distress will come to Jerusalem. Enemies will surround her and lay her citizens low. Your voice shall come from the ground like the voice of a ghost, and from the dust your speech shall whisper. But God will hear his people whisper and deliver them. After they have suffered for a little while, God will overturn everything. Their enemies will vanish, he says, like a dream, a vision of the night. His children will get up the next morning, shake off the nightmare, and go on with their lives. This was not only a promise for this one siege or that particular war in Israelite history. This was God's promise to all ages, 
a call to trust in him amidst the upheavals in our world. His word could not be more clear, yet people pretend it's elusive and unintelligible. God warns us about people who treat the Bible as though you and I could never understand it without their help. Such helpers like these have been around since the Garden of Eden. Satan helped Eve understand what God really meant when he said, you shall not eat the fruit of this tree lest you die. You shall not eat actually meant, go ahead and eat. And you will die actually meant, you will not die. See how helpful that was. Then, of course, Eve helped herself to the forbidden fruit and taught Adam to do the same. Although there were exceptions like Joseph of Arimathea, the members of the council in Jesus' day thought they were helpers too. These experts in the law took God's law and added layer upon layer of their own rules and regulations until the love of God, which is the true spirit and fulfillment of his law, was all but suffocated. They taught the people to gather for worship at the right place and the right time, but the heart of worship, the heart of faith, had been cut out. You who hide deep from the Lord your counsel, whose deeds are in the dark, and who say, Who sees us? Who knows us? You turn things upside down. Or to put it more bluntly, you make things perverse. St. Jude warns us in his letter, They pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. False teaching seeks to erode God's truth. It begins by calling grace into question. They tell you, grace is too easy. Our conduct must have something to do with how God feels about us. They tell you grace isn't necessary. There's no need for forgiveness if there is no sin. And by rejecting faith in God's clear word, false teaching ends in a rejection of God himself. God, our maker and redeemer, is overturned. And you and I come out on top. Who sees us? Who knows us? When we treat God the same way, mouthing the right words on Sunday, but doing whatever we want the rest of the week. Helping others understand that they too can do whatever they want, as long as they clean up their mess at the end. Teaching others, even our own children, to follow our example. What's God going to do about it? Hypocrites have an answer for that. Isaiah quotes them in chapter 28, the chapter before this one. When the overwhelming whip passes through, it will not come to us, for we have made lies our refuge, and in falsehood we have taken shelter. Will that shelter protect you from the God who is everywhere, who sees all, knows all, and demands perfect righteousness of you and your children? Shall the potter be regarded as the clay, that the thing made should say of its maker, He did not make me? Or the thing formed, say of him who formed it, he has no understanding? The answer is no, or at least not forever. Because we do not worship God with our hearts as we should, because we try to hide our dark decisions from him, because we listen to people who teach us to reject his gifts, he has every right to say, therefore, behold, I will have nothing more to do with them. But that's not what he says. This is verse 14 in Isaiah 29. Therefore, behold, I will again do wonderful things with this people, with wonder upon wonder, and the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the discernment of their discerning men shall be hidden. God fulfilled this promise by sending his Son into our world. Jesus came to scatter the proud in their thoughts, as his mother sang, to expose the fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition, making void the word of God and killing the souls of men. Jesus came to be light for the world, to proclaim God's eternal truth to people walking in darkness and teach them a new understanding of God's abundant grace. Jesus taught the truth. He lived it with his whole heart, 
and he died for it. In those hours when darkness reigned over the earth, he endured the eternal suffering that we deserved. Then he rose from the dead and put an end to that reign. Jesus lives to proclaim the victory of his life and death, wonder upon wonder, for all who believe in him. When it comes to what we need to know for our salvation, God's word is clear. That doesn't mean that every verse is so clear when we first read it. For example, I think we'd agree that the most unclear verse in our text is verse 17. Is it not yet a very little while until Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field and the fruitful field shall be regarded as a forest? Now we know that God wants us to answer yes to this question instead of no like the earlier questions, but what exactly is he promising here? Lebanon was, and still is, Israel's closest neighbor, one of them anyway. Its glory was its forest of cedar trees. Those trees provided beams for Solomon's temple in Jerusalem. Solomon also used them to build something called the House of the Forest of Lebanon, sort of a museum of cedars, which he used as an armory. Over time, what we see is there was an erosion of Lebanon's glory, not just because their trees were cut down, but because they were caught up in the same distresses that befell Jerusalem. Here in Isaiah, in the midst of all these promises to Israel, God promised that the fortunes of Lebanon would also be restored, but restored according to his will, not theirs. Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field, and the fruitful field shall be regarded as a forest. Here was another promise of the Savior, who would give new life to all people, both Jews and Gentiles. But new life in Christ doesn't mean the return of former glory. That was part of the darkness of man's misunderstanding that Jesus had come to correct, even after his resurrection. He was still correcting it. The two disciples on the road to Emmaus told him they were sad because they thought he would be the one to redeem Israel. Just before he ascended into heaven, the disciples asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? What about Joseph of Arimathea? Luke says he too was looking for the kingdom of God. Now that his faith had been brought into the light, what do you think happened to his own glory? Do you think he kept his prominent place on the council? Did he stay rich and respected? You and I have all things in Christ, our risen and ascended Lord, but we are still human beings, citizens of the world. We still engage in the same kind of wishful thinking about former glory. Is that so wrong? Couldn't we use some of that old glory in our country and in our churches? Or is glory now just an exhibit at a museum? Our personal wishes may be a little more modest. We're not asking for a forest of cedars to spring up when we snap our fingers. We just want our money back because we made bad decisions with it. We want our friends back after we decided to let something petty drive us apart. We want to feel the way we used to feel toward our wife or husband. We want our children to smile again. We just want to be well. We can ask God for anything, but we should always listen to what he says. He has turned everything upside down, which is really right side up again, through the righteousness of his Son and the pouring out of his Holy Spirit. And he promises wonder upon wonder in this new life of faith. He forgives us for all our dark decisions, everything we tried to hide from him, including our role in his son's crucifixion. And then he reclaims us as his children and gives us eternal life in his kingdom. Our new life, all of it, it's entirely in his hands as clay to the potter. We trust in him, our maker and redeemer, to give our life in this world purpose and meaning. We may not get back everything or everyone we've lost, but God will get us through each day by his grace. In a little while, the distress will vanish. The humbled will be lifted up. Our life shall be turned into a fruitful field for the blessing of our neighbors, and the fruitful field shall be regarded as a forest for the glory of God. 
In that day, Isaiah writes, the deaf shall hear the words of a book, and out of their gloom and darkness the eyes of the blind shall see. The meek shall obtain fresh joy in the Lord, and the poor among mankind shall exult in the Holy One of Israel. Dear friends, may we continue to obtain that fresh joy in the Lord, and exult in His Holy One, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, forever and ever. Amen. Now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.